let's do this. Okay, thank you for <laughs> Star Wars was a catalyst to a lot of the stories and games that I wanted to tell and had the pleasure of making. It's influenced everything that I've done from a very early age. When I started at Respawn, my mission was to start a new team and build a new game. Very quickly, we, we got five guys. Uh, we used to call ourselves Team Five Guys. I was here from the very beginning when we started this team. I was here for all the hiring, helped hire the combat team, helped interview other designers for the rest of the design department. We try to hire people that have a passion for wanting to make these games and right, are just positive, positive people. Yeah, it's five years since I started on this journey. Five years. <laughs> Today, actually, Star Wars came in as a, wow, okay. The weight on the shoulders of the team at the time when we started was just, okay, we're doing this. <laughs> So let's try to do it as well as we can. I was part of the team that made Titanfall, and then Titanfall 2, and in the midst of that, we decided to have a second team that would create a second game that ended up being uh, Jedi Fallen Order. During the day, I would do Titanfall 2, and at night, I would start working on, the, on the Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. We were working on a different game for a year and a couple months. One day, we got called into a conference room. They said that we could keep working on this game that we'd been developing for a year, or we have this opportunity to build a Star Wars game. We, as a team, got to choose, and it was unanimous. We were a team built to make a melee-centric combat game, and we saw the opportunity to make a lightsaber game, and um, you don't pass up that opportunity. The game we hired you to work on, we're not gonna do that game. <laughs> It's gonna be Star Wars, how do you feel? And I was like, oh my God, it just felt like we hit the lottery. So Stig came up to tell us about this idea he had and about this team he was building to make a uh, melee-driven action-adventure game. Everyone's mind jumps to Jedi. So the Star Wars name is Jedi Fallen Order. Woo, so Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. We learned very early on, Jedi, they're considered the holy grail at Lucasfilm and uh, we're gonna need to earn it every step of the way. I'm Jared Petty and this is IGN News. Titanfall developer Respawn Entertainment is working on a new third-person Star Wars game. The project will be led by Stig Osmundsen, the former God of War 3 creative director. Osmundsen said, we promise to pay respect to the Star Wars legacy at all times, a fact that will be constantly reinforced and honored as a central game design tenet. Fans should expect the exemplary level of quality first established at Respawn with Titanfall, a game that epitomizes our studio's dedication to slick, larger-than-life action and fun groundbreaking mechanics. What started as a team of five, four years ago, is now over 140 developers, all striving to translate Star Wars into that signature Respawn gameplay. What are you guys looking at? Pairing, Pairing against not somebody that's not your Z target, and what should happen? Stig is uh, easy target, pretty constantly. If you parried someone who wasn't your Z target, and we switched your Z target for you, come to have the penalty. I wouldn't want that. Yeah, okay. The Mantis, the hero ship, it's kind of like your literal home for the game. You just kind of hop from planet to planet and use the Mantis as the hub. 
bounced ideas back and forth with uh, Lucasfilm. They wanted to make it like a nice yacht style ship. That's what the big wing is for. It's kind of like a sail. So it's kind of a level, kind of a character. It's a hybrid of a lot of different stuff. I tried to keep it as close to the same detail style as the original movies. I thought it was really important that we kind of created that consistency between the films and, and the game. It's really nice to be able to kind of like pick things from other ships and put them on ours. And people have even been able to identify like, oh my God, that's a piece from the B-Wing or that's a piece from the A-Wing. So the consistency is there, which is really nice. Like any other game, we have a lot of uh, abilities that are built into the game. We want to find a really connective way for players to engage with the skillfully and learn the abilities. So you go to these meditation sites that allows you to like gain more and more skills. We've looked at a lot of um, the star charts that are in the Star Wars movies, um, some of the official line work that we got from Lucasfilm. We've got to incorporate it into the designs. This is him in the back of the cave, okay? I don't, I think this area should be pitch black, but there should be a source light nearby that leads us over there. But the back could show up, land on the ground in a rock and fall. <laughs> My name is Kasumi Shishido. I am a senior producer at Respawn. My main responsibility is working with Lucasfilm on a daily basis and also working very closely with the combat team and concept art team, managing their daily schedules and tasks. Like, 10 years ago. I was interning at like a advertising firm where they specialized in game commercials. That was back when uh, God of War 3 came out. My very first job was to clean up B-rolls and I made a folder for Stig and I was like cleaning up his like all his interviews and B-rolls. I never imagined that I would be working with him. The main thing is that this one has uh, a little bit more detail from a far away Star Wars has been so rewarding and such a passionate endeavor because there's there's so much history to look into. It's just such an unbelievable chance. This one's all mine. Face and body Lars, are we still outsourcing the hair? Can I do the hair? So if I'm scheduled, I get to do the hair, <laughs> which is my favorite part. We get a static model from a character artist and we add structures like uh, bones, skeletons uh, into that model and then we add control systems to drive those skeletal structures and those muscles and at that point we hand it off to the animators for evaluation. They're able to you know, articulate the model, bend it and flex it in places where you would expect and then they kick it back to us. We get feedback from them, you know, this is not feeling right or can we clean up the deformations in this area. One of the particular requests we had had for Cal was that this vest piece that he's wearing move independently of his body, that it not feel like it was painted onto him. This is a great reference for me to get realistic deformations for different layers of costume, so yeah. This is very helpful for information. Now we have real world information, take that back into the game um, to make sure that it's all as real as possible. Trying to get the blade a little bit longer? The, the hilt. The hilt. There are shorter hilts, but they're still more natural. Extend out a bit. Yeah. Pushing this a little bit. Yeah, extend out the leather. Bit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think we can kind of fake that a little bit too between the things. When you sign up to make a Star Wars title, you become basically part of the Star Wars team. We spend a lot of time coming down to Respawn's offices, meeting with Stig, his team, his leads. We have the young youngling ones that are actually really small lightsabers that we're using in Episode 3. The kids that you see go to training in Episode 2, I don't know if they built those or if they just like pulled them off a rack. I think specifically we're talking about the, the younglings, like Sears, Hack uh -huh. that gets abandoned, they're the ones who have the lightsabers. Also, we don't know those characters. Yeah. We work with the developers uh, from really concept all the way through completion on basically everything it takes to tell a Star Wars story in the interactive space. So there's a lot of character stuff that needs to be reworked and a couple of spoiler things that made it in there. Then the Seer Cordova one we think is stronger. It takes the bones of what was in the book that we all seem to right, like. Right. I'm a member of the Lucasfilm Story Group. We are a team that's responsible for overseeing the development across all platforms, whether that's animation, video games, and we make sure that all of that remains continuous and authentic. What we're looking at this morning is the progress in the Order 66 level. The team has done a really good job fixing the game was playable and representative of where we're headed. 
So it's a good time for us to give feedback. Um, we are mostly pulling from reference from Clone Wars and Rebels. If you guys do go with the Rodian, which is totally fine, if you could do the orange skin Rodian rather than the green skin. I think that was the image that Rich sent, but I'll make sure that no one gets called out. We're always so involved in the story. Um, so we know the story like the back of our hand. So actually getting to see you know, what we've discussed about conceptually put to use you know, on a screen of somebody physically playing it, it's, it's really yeah. cool. Cal is in the temple and Jaro is in the temple, but what we're seeing in the Jaro fight is more Void-like? Correct, yeah. Okay. We actually have a sync with Lucasfilm every day on different subjects. Either it's art or just concept art or a script and story and reviewing modeling and animation and rigging. The primary goal of an animator is to make sure that the character that's on screen is uh, feels alive, has a purpose, and basically is fun to watch and to... And to Play with to portray life you you want to portray life as it is which is you know things takes time to move to translate that into a game that can be challenging from an animation standpoint it comes from design they tell us what they want and then we go and create some preliminary animation and then they come back and say it's too slow it needs to be faster so then we edit it until you know both design and animation is happy it just started with me, and then pretty quick we had Lore uh, Retif on the team. She was helping out with BD1, which is a, an essential part of our game. I've been working on BD1 for three years now. He's very interesting to animate because he doesn't have a face where we can, he can express emotions. It's mostly in the head movements and the antenna. A little bit like a, a dog, he's always curious about everything. So. He wants to jump off and go anywhere, just run around and find stuff. <laughs> the reason for having BD in the first place was that it's a single player traditional game, but we wanted to add all the dialogues and the interactions between two characters. And one of the solutions was to have a droid who could emote. And in Star Wars, droids are more than just machines. They're, they're full out characters. They evoke emotion. I just about had enough of you. The idea of BD1 being cautious in regards to himself is super unlikely, because BD1 will basically run at death. I think a lot of BD1 stuff isn't so much as a game mechanic, it's more just as a kind of friendship yeah. type. It's the yeah. feeling that you've got this friend that's accompanying you on the journey. Well, I suppose the secret of, of BD1 is sol solving the problem of how to get something mechanical and robotic to sound kind of like a being you know, something with a heart. Part of the reason why we hired Ben Burt was that he's the expert on that very thing. So the idea came up to really combine this human sound with the electronic sound. That way we still might be able to have the character of a machine, but get the personality and the emotion of a living organism. The way Ben will work on things is he'll do it with his voice first, and then he'll add synthesizer sounds to that and kind of track what he's doing with his voice using the synthesizer. Having the little guy get on your back was an idea that was pulled from when Luke carries Yoda on Dagobah in his training. It also ties really well with our game because at any point the droid can look around and go, hey, look at that wall. Like, here's an information about this thing. For the AI part, I have uh, made a system that supports like hack doors or like we want to uh, investigate bodies. It's basically the POI system is driving the BD. POS stands for point of interest. We use it as a way of um, attracting AI characters to certain spots in the world. So for BD-1, we use it for whenever he wants to scan something or overcharge a power generator, he'll automatically detect its location in the world and start trying to move towards it since he hasn't before. In the Star Wars universe, droids are some of the most iconic characters that we can offer fans. Having the opportunity to model and texture and be part of bringing BD-1 to life was, was a huge honor. This is my original Star Wars figure collection from when I was a kid. C-3PO was the first action figure that my dad ever bought me, which kind of propelled me into this career of art. And uh, that was in 1978. So that, that figure of top is 40, 41 years old at this point. Now, the day that I actually get a, an action figure of, of BD-1, then, then my life has become full circle, then I have my own Star Wars figure that, uh, that I actually contributed to. And the way you have like a combat designer or a level designer, um, we have narrative designers that approach it from a narrative standpoint. Okay, so um, 
I'm gonna check out a rehearsal video for Ben Marin. They're not friends, they're not allies, but they kind of realize that they're not enemies. I'm the narrative lead on Jedi Fallen Order. I am responsible for all things narrative in the game. Writing, VO, cinematics, and then narrative features. Sen's writing this and, and recording those. The first couple scenes, she's imperious, and she's very much like, this is my place, you can't come here. But in the early rehearsal, she had been much more like, go away, right? And like really aggro out the gate, and I wanted to avoid that. So one, one thing just to bear in mind is that like, to get a lot of attention on this thing, it's, it's gotta go through him, right? So it's like, I'm wondering if, especially in light of the fact the last time we saw her, she summoned an army of these creatures that bear down on him and almost ripped him to pieces, right? Do you want him to like pop? Like is he yeah, igniting I think everything? He's not a fool. So we're getting towards our real deadline for being done with all the writing for the game. It's coming down to the wire. What's on the schedule for Thursday? Thursday is the Malico scene for sure. And then we're doing stunts Friday. Performance capture is basically where you film the cinematics of the game. And they're running around the set, swinging plastic lightsabers at each other. But you're also capturing facial animation on the set. Lightsaber dueling is as cool as what it sounds. It's what every kid wants to do. I know for me, we would be on the playground smacking each other with sticks, you know, pretending to be Jedi. And it's kind of surreal that I actually get to do it. Doing performance capture is the most freeing thing that any actor could ask for because you're bound by nothing except the lack of talent, in my case. This is fine. Everything's gonna be okay. With Star Wars, there is a language and a tone and everything that's been set before, but I think what's very important was with, with every new piece within the universe, you want to be able to bring in your own personality. Cal was a Padawan when the Jedi Order fell during Order 66, and he's been living in hiding since then. Order 66 is when Palpatine, who is the Supreme Chancellor of the Republic, pulls a coup and becomes the Emperor. Cal is a person who's on the light side of the Force, but that being said, Cal's relationship to the Force is pretty volatile. He was not finished with his training when the purge happened, so he has a lot of trauma that's associated with the usage of the Force. And basically, every time he taps into it, it's a bit explosive and tends to lose control. I view story as being part of the gameplay experience, and the goal is to make it as seamless as possible so that it feels like this fluid, custom living world. This cooking here is where we will then see where Order 66 is issued. The level I'm working on is Order 66, which is the experience of young Cal right before the moment where Order 66 transpires and the aftermath, which is a really cool experience because the player actually gets to experience this transitional moment for the Jedi. Coming down, the clones are rounding the corner, coming at you, start taking fire. The intent is that they will be able to parry, blast back at them. Give our same show, very strong wars, and see if we can pull that off. We knew it was time to sort of like pull the lid off the game and show it to the public. We didn't want to reveal gameplay until gameplay was ready to be revealed, and we wanted to do that at a game-focused event like E3 and EA Play. And what we had to show was story and narrative. But we sort of had the opportunity to unveil the game at a peak Star Wars event of the year. For Star Wars Celebration, as we moved forward with the trailer, there was a lot of schedule adjustments, so it was really difficult trying to balance all of that. So we had our internal planning when it came to like what kind of characters we would have done at certain months. But for the trailer, so we have all these stuff that we need for Braca that we're planning to do later, uh, but we need to do ASAP. Star Wars Celebration really brought up the motivation for everybody. It kind of turned the switch on, thinking about the past years of all the work that we put in, growing from like 30 people to we have about 140 people right now. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order was announced last year, but up until now, not much has been known about the game. Well, that all changed yesterday when EA finally revealed both a teaser image and the official logo of the game. What does it mean? Hopefully we'll get answers this Saturday, April 13th at 1.30 p.m. Central Time during EA's Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order panel. If you guys aren't familiar with Star Wars Celebration, it's like the premier Star Wars fan event. We are on the biggest stage that Celebration has got. It's going to be in front of about 7,000 people. 
because this is a story game, because we don't have that many beats to communicate, loose lips bring down starships. You see a lot of questions buzzing around. If you see a lot of things that people aren't sure about, don't feel the need to jump in and correct them. Let people lose their minds. This is exactly what we want leading up to celebration. So don't, don't ruin the fun by communicating more than you should. Respawn, I was so pumped. What better than having a chance to do this game than them right now? Because I play Apex Legends, and so Respawn made that. I was like, you know, Titanfall 2, they made that. They're rock stars. Star Wars was one of the only major things that, like, my brother and my dad and I all bonded over together. I'm looking forward to having Force abilities, um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to what they're going to bring to that. I'm absolutely stoked to be able to put a Star Wars lightsaber in players' hands, let them be a Jedi, let them build up their Force powers, and learn different ways to wield that saber. It's incredible. I mean, we know that respawns are just masters at, at tactical combat. I've been working on Star Wars for going on 15 years now, and to be able to make a single-player Jedi Star Wars game, like, that's why we do this. Walking towards that theater and seeing all the fans like cosplaying outside, lining up. I was actually videotaping it and sending it to my team saying like, oh my God, look at all these people waiting to see our trailer. I'm supremely confident about the game and uh, a total wreck otherwise about my own performance or what I'm gonna say on stage, so. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to Star Wars Celebration. Hearing their cheer, as much as I was nervous, I really felt like this is my responsibility to get this right and deliver you know, what is expected. Myself, everybody on this panel, and everybody back at Respawn in Los Angeles, Woo! we're putting our heart and soul into this game, so we, we really can't wait to show you more right at the end when the logo reveals. Um, I got goosebumps too, so I just can't wait to see the reaction. Wasn't always like this. Execute order 66. We work so much and we're making a game and we get caught up in dealing with the vicissitudes of development, but then sometimes, like today, all that washes away and you're just like, you're a kid again. People are excited about this game, and we're really going to ship in November. My message directly to the team is, here we are. This is real, and it doesn't get any bigger than this. This is a very special opportunity that we have, and I'm confident that we're all going to do it together and have a great game. It was a fun weekend, seeing all that stuff. Yeah. Just seeing the reaction online, kind of seeing the change in reaction right away that people didn't quite know what to think. Then you could just see the, the swell of like support for it and excitement for it. Initially there was that, there's no gameplay kind of downside, which we knew we would get, um, but we've got gameplay. I'm Jeff Majors, lead level designer. The level designers put together the game, kind of define what the areas are in the game, what the challenges are we're gonna put in front of the player, what environments are we gonna go to, what puzzles are we gonna do, what combat encounters the player's gonna experience. In four months, Respawn needs to be ready to ship this game. But before they ship it, they need a locked and stable build to test at UXR. With the next UXR around the corner, they still have a lot to incorporate into this game. UXR is user experience research. It's where we play test the game. So we find people outside of the studio to play our game blind. And it's really the first time we can kind of get a gut check of where we are and where we need to go. The ledges were just all crazy, crazy so large. You gotta make yeah. all this clean. 
And so we spent the last few days doing that for the UXR areas. Finding the fun is a lot about iteration. When you're building a level, the level designer will be working on it for six months from start to finish. And this is for like a 30 or 45 minute section of the game. It's really about zooming in on all the little moments and details and kind of obsessing over every little moment and thinking what is going to be best for, for the player at any given time. This whole area here, we just have spiders. It's all spiders. So yeah. we need to do something to make it. They just, it feels a little dull. And we're going to do a damage pass on these guys, right, Jason? There's a lot of factors, right, that make lightsaber combat rewarding. It's the encounter. Who's in the encounter? How fast do they die? How good does it feel for them to block your lightsaber or counter you? All those little details and actions, that's the stuff that I always want to like try to improve and make sure every AI is doing their job. Once we get this first pass in, I want you guys to just like play it over and over again, like play that one fight like 10 times in a row, move a guy a meter, play a fight again, die to that fight, try to play it a different way. Like noodle, noodle the f out of it. Like, yeah. Cool. This guy's good work. Let's polish, polish over the next week. Yep. The core focus is make a game that reacts really well. How good a game feels has a lot to do with reducing the layers of interference between what the player wants to do and what the game does out of it. At the very beginning, the UI team was just uh, uh, Kevin and I. We had to make sure that we kept each and every part of the map close to Star Wars. Kevin and I went through each and every Star Wars film, looked at each hologram, see which one we wanted to be like. We were able to be very collaborative, exploring how we want the player to feel when they're using the map. I kind of like the idea of we show wall runs just as part of the geo. We want to make sure that like if you're looking for it, you can see it. We should be looking at like the larger game, especially considering that that's what the CUXR is all about. I like my team to focus first and foremost on gameplay and first and foremost on what is going to be the fun thing. And then if we're thinking of how it matches kind of the Star Wars universe, we should have that in our mind as well. But that should be secondary to making the gameplay space feel fun. We just pull random people from the team and just sit back and watch them play it. And we just chat about it and kind of hear their thoughts. We get a lot of the first obvious feedback from these internal play tests. What happened? Well, I went pretty good, I think, for except for that one spot. One yeah, spot that's exactly. nasty. Like the... <laughs> With a game this size and with this many people working on it and with the polish level that we want to hit for when we play test the game, there's just a lot left to do. I mean, when it works, I like it, but it seems like it works, it's broken more than it's working. I know. Okay. If we want him to have this kind of motion, some of the pivot, it feels like the pivots are triggering too easily in a, in a line, and I want to pull back on them somehow. Uh, and the more we pull back on them, the less they're going to start triggering when we don't want them to trigger. The pivots are just to sell the idea that if you're turning hard, then you get a, an animation response to that. Bruce and Fabrice had started developing the system that would allow this high fidelity animation, but not sacrifice responsiveness. And then it's up to me to make that animation sort of reassemble itself appropriately inside the engine. A lot of games that are as responsive as ours aren't quite as nuanced. It's difficult to pull off the animation fidelity, but still have them move at these superhuman speeds and reactivity. How do you really find something that's fun? I don't really know that there's an answer to that other than just you keep on trying, you keep on iterating. It's usually good to have some type of guiding light. I'm just a sucker for David versus Goliath. Cal going up against the, the entire empire and the entire galaxy. He's also going up against these giant mythical beasts. So this is the gigantic like, mass boss fight, um, Dathomir. It's a three-phase boss fight that we've got lined up. Basically, as the player's going through Dathomir, you'll get some previs of a bat flying by and stuff happening, picking up night blows and things like that. Eventually, the path kind of narrows you down into this kind of a section, and then this is kind of where we first encounter the bat. All of a sudden, boom! A huge, gigantic bat comes in. Are you introducing boss names? Like, when they pop up, are you going to be like, Big Blind Bat well, on the screen? Yeah, or? that yeah. we discussed. Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah, Good yeah. question. Yeah. Well, we call them wow moments. We basically want people's jaw to drop the, from the floor. They pick it back up, and it falls back down again. So the story is that, like, hey, you're hurting him. He doesn't like this. His hands are a little bit wounded. He'll crawl out, 
and you think you're safe. Hey, cool. And then, lo and behold, boom, bat flies by, a little bit wounded, is not a fan of yours right now. And he's like, I couldn't kill you in this cave, but out here, I win. Eventually, he snatches you off of that mountain. He crashes into stuff, and you actually become disconnected from him in midair. You enter this kind of free fall Patrick Swayze awesomeness. <laughs> and boom, you lash back on. So he jumps out, and as the bat's just free flying, just flying around, so you have to steer around and then grab him in order to kind of use him. So you use the bat to get down off of this gigantic mountain that you'd been scaling and fighting him along. Why is there a cut every single time he attaches? To reorganize the world because there's so much variance because the player can kind of steer themselves around to grab onto the bat, so we have to reorganize them in order to get that next shot. There's, yeah, there's one every time he grabs onto, there's three. Is there a way that we can fix that? When you, get, yeah. when you latch back on? Especially when you're still close to him. You're right there, and then we just, if you want to... Well, I mean, the, we can't interpolate, like... Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is that when the player's falling, we have control. He's got, like, a cone where he can be kind of anywhere. So he can grab the bat over here or over here. There's not really a way for me to say, like, okay, where's he at? Play the animation at this point, at this world location, based on where you grab on. Have you involved a, a coder with this? Yeah. We don't have camera cuts. You have to see that whole thing, that epic Vader cut marching down, murdering 15 people. That's, like, 18 cuts to make it look as beautiful as it can. So we've got to be able to take that and make it such a way that no matter where the camera is, no matter who's controlling it, it still looks that good. And they've set a really high bar for that. And that's what we're doing is making sure that we keep up to that bar as well. Designers will use Lego to make levels. We make the Lego bricks. That's what it forever does. Spend a lot of time looking at the Star Wars films trying to get the kind of look and feel of what uh, Star Wars looks like. I found some references from the old uh, camera lenses that were used in those original Star Wars films, um, which were Panavision, so they were uh, anamorphic, so that uh, all the things like the uh, depth of field, um, even down to our film grain, everything gets that scaling and stretching, which gives it that, that kind of filmic look, uh, really makes it just a little bit closer to the film. Respawn wanted the Force Little ability as a foundation for their combat for the game. So we worked with them to translate that ability to make it fit within the Star Wars universe. Cal, his main power is slowing something down. And that's something we went back and forth with Lucas. Oh, he's doing this too fast. He's casting too fast. Yeah, because that's what feels good in gameplay. So we had to kind of come to this compromise where you hold the button down for three seconds, then he'll force slow longer, right? Somebody will be slow longer. Cal has to show that he's exerting himself and his, his ability to control the force, to use the force. So really straining and really being strong with his hand. And we want to make sure whenever you use power, it's not magic. It's he's actually, his physical ability and his skill with the force is allowing him to do this manifestation. Colors and everything that you've applied in the breakup all seems correct. So that, the details there. Your concern here is more about getting the helmet shape to fit right and then getting the color to fit. Yeah, so he feels see. intimidating. If you take this straight down and you incorporate this going around, like, and you get those straight shoulders, really pinhead, I think it's cool. It's just pulling in the final edits, and we call it a day. Shake hands, high five. <laughs> I've worked alongside concept and the game design to flesh out the overall look and feel of the planet and the environment. When we get approval from Lucasfilm, on something that I've created, I mean, it's really makes my day. You know, Hez or something comes in and then says like, oh, that looks really awesome or like, that's such a great Star Wars moment. I mean, that feels really good, right? Because you're like, oh, I nailed it. This is, this is right, right here. Beautiful. Sometimes it's finding ways to support different people's opinions and making sure like they're, what they start, you make sure it goes through. And, and, and talking through it just helps because we have, yeah. we're all lifting Star Wars up yeah, yeah. by doing that, we have to support what Star Wars is as sure. well. And find those elegant solutions for, as we always say, complex Star Wars problems is what we what we can do while working together. What are we going to look at today? Today we have force targeting, which got updated and is now showing a highlight. So we should talk about that. One thing we're trying is it's just an outline on these guys. It's pretty subtle. I don't know if I want an outline around every enemy that you're engaging with the entire game. I guess um, I don't know if I've ever, I've felt like I've needed this. What are we doing wrong that other games don't have that? I mean, we have 
force powers that other games don't have. But like, right. My thinking right now is we should take this to UXR and see what the feedback is. Can I play a little yeah. bit? Be honest, when I'm playing it, it's not bothering me as yeah. much because it is a really subtle effect. Yeah. But if it's so subtle, is it even doing anything yeah. for us? It seems like it could be off for 90% of the game. So. That's that's kind of what I'm getting at. We're yeah. going to turn something on for 100% of the game that could really be off for 90% of the game. Right. I don't know if that's the. Sig doesn't come in and dictate. It's more he can come in and be like, okay, well. Here's what I'm seeing for the game right. from a bigger vision than what just the story, just the art. So, like, how can we make it all work? A lot of compromising, yeah. yeah. That would trigger the cinematic the first time. And we go into this um, cinematic where we save the two rebels or Parsons. Do you kill people in the cinematic? We don't do that anywhere. Is this the one that you and Aaron were talking about a couple weeks ago and we were going through cuts? Yeah, he said he was gonna, we were going to do this in gameplay, not in the real cinematic. Like, we we're going to find a different way to do it. We can't kill somebody in the cinematic. <clears throat> yeah. We just want to go from enemy to enemy and feel like you're in real time taking out five guys in a row. But if there's an intro cutscene or some kind of like long, delayed moment that breaks that pacing, then to some players, that's going to be a bad reaction. But we're making a Star Wars game that's very story driven and cinematic. So that's, that's kind of the new wrinkle. Well, we should sit back with Aaron on this one. Aaron and John have been working really hard to get all of the PCAP going and getting all of our scenes shot, but there's a huge task of implementing all of those in-game. Cinematics is something that we started later than everything else. Getting a script through, Lucasfilm is just completely dialed into this. This is a Star Wars story, and it took a long time. It took a ton of effort. The team was just kind of focused on making a game. I think we all kind of miscalculated how long it was going to take to make the story. We have a mountain of cinematics that we have to get in the game. Each one is challenging. A lot of cutscenes take place while we're doing planet hopping, while we're streaming in and out different levels, while we're loading things in the background. There's a lot of complex game logic and complex technical things that go on during these cinematics. So to get all of these at the highest fidelity that we want, the time's running out. I know the team that's working on it is extremely dedicated. They've been on a, you know, basically a mission, just shooting all the PCAP. I know the story's good, but it comes down to execution. What goes into here is such heart and such soul, such work. You have to capture the reality. You have to capture the truth. You have to capture the transparency. We will be tested. Yeah. But I'm ready for this. I don't mean just here. Every Jedi faces the dark side. And it's very easy to fail. One of the biggest themes in this is Nobody is perfect and maturing and, and trusting the force means you have to allow mistakes and even have to allow that maybe the mistakes are okay. You're still struggling, even after cutting yourself off from the force. Failure is something that we tend to define ourselves by and we tend to hold on to failure stronger than nearly any other emotion. It's what creates change within us. We will always struggle. But that is the test. It's the choice to keep fighting that makes us who we are. So when Seer hands him her lightsaber, it's on the one hand a functional thing because we want the hero's lightsaber to eventually have ingredients from Jarl Tapal's, his former dead master's lightsaber, and the ingredients from Seer Jundo's, his new mentor's lightsaber as well. From a character perspective, Seer is warning him. She's saying, even if you succeed here on Ilum, even if you succeed tomorrow, next month, there's a challenge every day you wake up, and it's really easy to fail. And when you do fail, there could be consequences. So it's kind of a word of warning. Even though she's encouraging to go out there, and get back on the horse, find a kyber crystal, she's saying there will never not be hills and challenges. It never gets easier, you just get stronger. Cut. So it'll give us something like this, very, very rough, and we'll start timing out the edit and the action, make sure everything flows and get it approved. And then it'll go to the actual animation team. Tomorrow's luck. Or, uh, yeah, I mean, really it's like however late people work tonight, it's tomorrow morning's luck. Things are, are always breaking. 
but once we lock things down, it becomes easier to track what's breaking what. So tomorrow we're gonna lock things down. You know, people have a lot invested, so they're, they're trying to get the things that we know are bugs that we wanna get in, but also for polish, but also things individually that people wanna get in to make it as good as it can be. Bugs let you know like what you need to fix to, to ship the game. Bugs is, a, is the friction that players will experience and you want to reduce as much friction as possible. From what I've heard, the build has become progressively more unstable. We locked at 4 p.m. and now the focus is just trying to get a stable build. It's, everyone's kind of on fire right now, so let's see how it goes. <laughs> Blair is the person, okay. he is the producer tracking all of UXR. First comes stability, so anything that actually just breaks the game from a progression standpoint, we call it zero, and it has to get fixed because the player just you can't beat the level or the creature or whatever it is. Closer and closer you get to the deadline, you just start to triage things out that aren't as important to the player experience. And then I work with the QA lead and the lead level designer to be like, of these 10 things on you or on your team, which do you think is the most important? He's taking a look at the whole list of bugs and goes and then prods people and asks them like progress. So we're waiting for Honesty to fix one more change. She's testing it. She's like twiddling her thumbs, waiting for it to be done. Yeah, she's like, like, yeah, just essentially waiting so we can kick off the build. So, so we have one, one right left. now. We have one, one bug left. One bug one left. Bug. And that's the one the ship? Yep. That's it. Yeah. Good. Down to one. Down to one. So I'm going to have to. Wait, so who's working on it? Monacy. Can we look from afar? You cannot. <laughs> she just needs to, she's a programmer, she's in the zone. Production update, yay. Um, I actually just wanted to like thank everybody. Um, I know I've been bothering, I think, everybody here almost, except Aaron, um, about UXR stuff. I originally set what I thought was, um, I essentially set us up to fail. Um, I put too much in the UXR build kind of knowingly, just to see how far we could push stuff. You guys got it all in, and it's working, and it's a huge amount of game, and it sets us up for alpha amazingly. Um, I've never been more proud to be part of a team of such like amazing developers. Um, you closed 750 bugs over three weeks, so thank you. Um, I know there's lots of learnings for how we can make this process easier and better. I'm sure not everybody's super happy with me right now, but you did something really amazing, so um, thanks. <laughs> How many players are there playing the game right now? Uh, I think it's like 35 or so. Okay. So a lot of the stuff Nerd has done is is in this build, uh, and people are playing it for the first time. So it's kind of our first wave of feedback. Watching UXR is a great way to see just how it's developing. So right. I'm desperate. I'm starving for that stuff. Like, this is what really matters, right? It's the game game. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it's good because it's a good milestone, right? Like everything's culminated to this moment, so it's like the kind of breather spot. So you get to kind of sit back and do it, but you can't exactly enjoy it at the same time because you know that there's more work coming from it. But also you get to feel gratified because like, oh, that looked great, and they had fun doing this thing that I made, so that's super gratifying as well. No matter what the results are, good or bad, you know. If it's great, then you know what's good to enhance on. If it's bad, you know what to start trimming from. Is the very first time you open the planet map when all three of these planets are there? Yes. Yep. That's not great. Yeah. I mean, we decided very early on that we wanted to do multiple planets and, and you know, traveling in your spaceship between planets because that would make it feel very Star Wars. That was a pretty recent change that we allow you to go to Dathomir right after Bugano. The plan used to be that you would have to go to Zeppo and then you would unlock Kashyyyk at the same time, but opening it up earlier makes the game like open up earlier, which is kind of fun to see, but it's hard, so <laughs> we'll see how much people like it. It's that classic game design thing of let the player go to Mordor right off the bat and get their ass kicked. Yeah. Like that's Dathomir. That kind of like skill check. I mean, I think the greatest part of it is individual, like each individual has their task and they believe that they can get it done. They, they look at the schedule and they believe they can get it done, but they're skeptical. It's natural for the, them to not know if other people are in the same place because 
they're not as connected to other people's work. So they might feel like, hey, I'm doing everything I can to make my part good, but it can't be good if other people's parts aren't good. Then that just comes down to communication. It becomes really hard to communicate what everybody's doing all the time. Like I said, it's natural that until we've gone through this together and people see like, oh wow, everybody else kind of lifted their own weight and got it done and, and this product is shining together, people will remember that. game is looking kick-ass. That's it. For me, I still try to, like, if there's things that really shouldn't go in after lock, but people really want to get them in, and I want to get them in, I try to work with code and production to make a case for why we should try to get these things in. Next Tuesday, we're branching, so we'll open up the tree again and everybody can start dumping all their normal work in and the game will break again. But we'll have a branched version of the game that we can really be very careful about what we're inserting in that because we're just going to be chasing stability at that point. Branch is what we'll use for E3. E3, for several decades now, has been one of the most important moments in the calendar year for the video game industry. EA Play happens the weekend before E3 officially starts, so we kind of get ahead of all the noise and are able to show people our games and get their reactions and get that conversation going. Gamers nowadays aren't going to make up their mind and form a definitive opinion until we show them gameplay. So this is going to be the biggest inflection point in terms of sentiment in our entire campaign. We want to show them what they want, this raw, unedited demo that's going to prove that we're delivering the goods. Pretty much everybody I've talked to about it is like, do not show the ad app for the first thing that we ever show. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to give the, the impression that we're, you know, some just climbing around Laura Croft game, because that's not what we are. This is a moment in our game. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is kick, going around and kicking ass with a lightsaber. Right. And I worry when I hear that there's, you know, like, basically the first thing that anybody's going to see is not going to represent 99% of our game. Right, right. For EA Play, we really wanted to give people what we thought they wanted. It was the first time we were going to do live gameplay. We didn't take sections of the videos. It was like essentially me in a room for the weekend, mm -hmm. and I played it until I nailed it. Mm -hmm. And then I played it again until I nailed it again, and we sent those two off. Mm -hmm. And there was like thumbs up on that. This is video that would be like feel like straight gameplay. Like there's no one on stage playing, mm. but it's not like there are a bunch of cuts and edits like jumping ahead or back or anything like that. It's kind of straight from yes. meeting Saw, mm -hmm. you know, continuous all the way through to the Purge Trooper fight. Yes. Cool. That start was made for the first thing for us to show to public. That's because mm -hmm. it was supposed to be at EA Play as a purpose. Mm -hmm. Just because we have to get booking for E3 stuff, are you guys 100% sure we don't want to let press have hands on? From the very inception of our E3 demo, the plan, what I always wanted to do, and I messaged it very clearly to the team, is that it's hands-on. But then, as the realities of game making really start to take effect, being hands-on becomes a little bit riskier. And it's risky because it's got to be nearly bulletproof. It's going to be considerable greater resources and, and bug fixes and testing to just let anybody get their hands on the game. As someone who's been marketing respawn games for a while, there's so much that's hard to communicate about how controls feel that you just can't get across in, like if I could tell you a million times, like it feels really good to play, it feels like you forget the controller's there. Everyone we brought in to actually like play with this thing, even UXR, like, it's like, oh We're gonna be planning these big E3 media events. We better be careful. And I don't wanna get in a situation where we have to cancel something that we've spent a lot of money and put a lot of investment into if we're just not gonna be able to do it. Oh, I, I know it's, I know it'll be like a late, like last minute call, yeah. but just I need to put that I like value it. out. There was just no way that we could guarantee that we're going to go hands-on with this. It looked like the only time we were really going to get clarity on that would be maybe a week or two before E3. We're just going to get a behind-closed-doors room for press and judges to get hands-on, but if we don't use them, I we'll just use them for that, interview rooms. Yes, it might be more that. expensive, but then it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I could get behind that. New game, biggest IP in the world. First time we're showing gameplay. One thing this team has shown and proven through history is that they come through at the end.
So E3, we're trying to get like a finished version of the game and we're not yet at that point. So we're trying to get a representation that feels natural. The purpose of Kashyyyk is to show the juxtaposition of the virus of the Imperial destroying all of the planet Kashyyyk and its natural beauty is trying to fight back. Right now we're just working on optimization, trying to make sure it all runs and looks good in the demo. Kind of in that phase of the project that we're in uh, optimization. Basically, uh, people come into my office and say, hey, do you want to see something? And it's always something bad. And they go and fix it. So we can see with this view how many triangles we're using in places. So anywhere that we start to get really these really dense clusters, that's something we need to look at and think, uh, you know, we're spending too many triangles here, so we might want to reduce the amount. When you get to that point for E3, we have to make sure we have all of our graphics all up and running and all looking good enough to show to the public. And then you get a little glimpse of what the game's going to look like when it comes out at the end of the year. Today I'm making sure the climb animation looks good. There's a request coming from design that some of those moves are just too slow and I'm speeding it up. Right now I'm looking at the jumps. They take too much time recovering from jump to actual navigation on the wall. It needs to feel right otherwise, and, you know, it's, it's not a game, it's a, it's a movie. I think we're gonna be able to go hands-on with the whole thing, not just a fraction of the demo. As much as we want it to polish and make it look pretty and make it feel like it's the final game, we also need it to make sure that nothing is breaking when we hand the controller over to these uh, press. In regards to what's riding for this demo, everything, all the hard work that the entire team's putting into this game, um, if we f it up, it's all for nothing. It's a, it's a meaty demo. It's, it's not just a small section of gameplay, which was important to us. We wanted people to really see the game isn't just this small section. It's like, th this is like all of our main systems working and people can project and how that expands into a much larger game. So this impression is incredibly important. If we bomb it, it could be devastating. Die. Start again. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to get one contiguous take, so it's all real. No edits, no cuts. We're just trying to do it in one take, so getting all those perfect combats in one playthrough is a little bit more challenging. We really wanted to represent, this is the game how it is now. Tomorrow's our big reveal day. Saturday morning, one hour prior, our second social teaser goes live in social. And then 9.30, uh, we take center stage, we open EA Play. By the way, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to EA Play Play on Saturday at all. I didn't register. <laughs> Still over. I start with asking people on the team whose content I'm going to play through. What do you want to show off? But when you start playing, it's a live game and our AI works how our AI works for the real game. I'm trying to do a cool move, but during that, a spider jumps on me and breaks the flow. The longer the demo goes, the more risk. That guy that's next to the door, you can sprint with him and do the like, uppercut at him. Heartbreaking. There's other things that can happen that have nothing to do with the game, like you've got like a really weird itch or something like that. You're in the middle of something, it's like you gotta scratch this. I just wanna, you know, I wanna show this to the team and have them be like, oh, this is it. You know, it's okay to just play. Like, just go in and just like, I'm playing the game. It's EA Play. We're about to uh, unveil gameplay to the world. Just hope everybody loves it. of Respawn, Vince Zampella, and the director of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Stig Asmussen. Everybody give it up for Vince and Stig, come on! Keep it going, they're making a Star Wars game!
guys, welcome to EA Play. Yeah, this is something that Stig and I have been envisioning for years, to see it come to life and be able to show you guys 15 minutes of gameplay today. <laughs> Uncut. All right, all right. So everybody's anxious to see what this 15 minutes is going to be. They'd like to see the game. We've gone on long enough. We're not going to drone. Let's do it. Fitz, well, let's roll. Would you like to kick it off? Let's go. I didn't get any sense that there was anything going wrong at EA Play, but I started reading all the different articles that were a little confused on what we showed. With the EA Play gameplay reveal, there was a bit of misconception over what our game was. The gameplay we saw at E3 underwhelmed some people who thought it looked fairly generic. Yeah, it felt like a pretty standard linear action game, maybe even a little Uncharted-ish with lots of climbing and melee combat. We wanted to showcase every ability we could and show off all the cool moves. In hindsight, we probably should have just put it on hard because it did make the game seem a lot easier. We wanted to hit a slice of the game that showed off the core lightsaber elements, but in doing so, we kind of missed the opportunity to show everyone our nonlinear structure, our Metroidvania level design, our planet hopping, interactions with the crew, these big set piece moments. The only way you can feel how good the game is is to get your hands on the controls. That's the only way. E3 2019. I am going to be behind closed doors, uh, giving demos and hands-on to various uh, press people and potential E3 judges. I hope everybody just loves the, the authenticity we're trying to bring to Star Wars. Hopefully the time and the effort we put in this game is shown, so people respect that. That's the goal. Skeptical. I won't deny that, but Respawn is definitely amazing with gameplay and with story. So, I mean, who even knows like what's going to be like? I'm, I'm hooked. I'm into it. We're having a press um, like IGN, Game Informer. It's, it's basically like 30 minutes block of time, and we're just getting press in to try try out the game. It does feel good to play. So there is a lot of depth to the combat system. I do not think the combat in this game is going to get boring anytime soon. <laughs> Once anyone gets their hands on the game, they fall in love with it. The biggest takeaway I got from the brief hands-on experience I had was that the combat is very satisfying and challenging. Everything has been very, very positive. You see people walk in looking pretty tired and exhausted, and they walk out with a huge smile on their face. So that's what we want to see. The combat feels great. It's very and it's like you would expect from Respawn, it seems like there's a lot of growth in his abilities. You will get new force powers as the game goes on. I can't wait to see where it goes. So many people have walked out of here going like, okay, I see where we're going with this. When you actually play, the game flows exceptionally well. Though we only played for five minutes, I found the demo to be extremely fun. I feel like once you get your hands on it, you'll feel as I do. Whenever I run into any of my coworkers, I've been trying to tell them like how well it's going because they might just be reading those online threads still and that's it. It's been exciting to see people finally get their hands on it, get real reactions. Oh, look at me, look at that, it's so good. It's been a wild week, yeah. still trying to process it and um, it feels really good right now. These last three days I've been fully focused on E3, um, but tomorrow, back to work. <laughs> we gotta finish the game. This is it. The final stretch of a four-year journey. I'll be working on the lightsaber probably until the day that they tell me I can't work on it anymore. <laughs> 
this project has been a little different. We've been working in harmony with all the other departments going up until the end of the project. So we've gotten in a lot earlier than normally might happen in the game pipeline, making the lightsaber feel authentic. So you know, it's basically a glowing tube when it's still, but you know, when it's moving is a lot of the, the kind of the iconic look. So getting the right eye slice, having the right angle, not like a flag, and then having the atmospheric glow around it, working closely with combat, obviously. The lightsaber interaction stuff, that's got a lot of our focus. It's a lightsaber game, so it has to be. We are putting the final details, the final finesses on all the elements we can. It's all wrapping up and it's, uh, it's exciting. The things that were minor uh, months ago are now major. Cool, yeah, yeah. So right now I'm just trying to figure out how to get this graphic design to match this image. So I did get to do a pass on the logo. He has added manual streaks and wear and tear by hand. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Cool. Of course, cool. When Cal's doing, when he's holding prof, I don't know if the force feedback can rumble harder. We can do that, we can make the sound. Uh, so it feels like I'm holding prof, and now I'm holding the barge and I'm really straining here. Yeah, sitting five weeks away from boxing the game up and sending it off, uh, one word that comes to mind is tired, <laughs> but also proud, you know, like really, really proud. UI team as a whole, I mean, we're, we're stressed, but we're excited. We have these schedules that we follow, you know, it's like, oof. That's ambitious, but we know we can do it, but oof, that's ambitious. Um, so I see, I see smiling nods. Are there any bugs right now that you guys are tracking down regarding the motion model? Joe was saying there's certain cases when you hit the corner of a wall, he can feel oh. like he gets held up. Yeah, I'm having a really hard time breaking this. Good. It's great. You guys did it. Just stick a fork in it. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> like at this point right now, just. Let's try not to break it. Let's, let's try not yeah. to break it. Yeah. Let's. <laughs> We've been looking at this closely for. Uh, it's been under the microscope for like a year now. So. Congrats. You survived, Cal. And you're not alone. Not anymore. We're coming up on our destination. Um, biggest hopes for the game, you know, there's a lot of them. I would say that uh, when we started this, we wanted to make, you know, this Star Wars action adventure story game that we haven't seen in a long time. And we wanted to make the best one that we could possibly make. I really hope we do that. My biggest hopes are a lot more basic than that. I just want, you know, the whole team to have all this, this energy that they put into it and their love for Star Wars to be worth something and for this to be a game that they're really proud of. It's amazing seeing the mix of different species and people and, and kinds of characters. We're in these incredible, fantastic worlds and planets. Because this franchise is so large and so huge and so tremendous, there are many stories that have yet to be told. Take nine, Mark. Set a course for Pagano. When you're working inside of the motion capture volume, you have cameras, on the ceilings, on the sides, and on your face. And they're capturing every single bit of your biomechanics. We can literally run and chase each other and jump and take swings at each other, so. It's the closest to playing in my backyard at eight years old of any job I've ever had. Action. Please welcome Cameron Monaghan to the stage. I'm Cameron Monaghan. I play Cal Kestis in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Cal was a young Jedi Padawan during Order 66 when all of his kind were murdered. He escaped and managed to hide out on the scrap planet of Braca. 
he became a, a scrap worker and someone in hiding and someone kind of paranoid and fighting for his life. What's this? A brack of scrap rats weighing down. Then also he's rough around the edges and I think he kind of does like to fight too. <laughs> Gonna need to get through here. <laughs> Healing stem. They're full of surprises. VD1, our buddy droid, is uh, a wonderful addition to the droid family. He was sort of designed as like an adventure companion. By having me operating uh, uh, this little guy as a placeholder for the animators, it's also nice for the, for the other actors to have something to play opposite. And so that's kind of fun because then I can inject a little personality I feel that, that VD1 has. The two of them have a really wonderful relationship. In many ways, I think Hal's kind of best friend across the story. Okay, shut that thing off and grab some seeds. Seer and Grease enter into Cal's life explosively, and I think that Cal is of two minds about it. You've been surviving on your own for so long that it's impossible to trust anyone. And it's what's kept you alive. I think that ultimately he has to do this mission because this is what he was made for. He's a Jedi trying to restore balance. Before we do anything, I need to know something. How come you're no longer a Jedi? Seer Junda completely cut the Force out of use in her life. I had an experience that changed my perspective and she decided that she would not use the force because using it might pose a threat to not only her but to others which it already did to a certain extent yeah the man is my ship but you better pay attention to this lady here green stridus is not let's say the most affable latiron he's had some hardship in life he doesn't trust people too much what is that <laughs> Get off myself i can't I hope you found something better out there than this droid. Oh, calm down, Breeze. He's got something he's running from, and uh, it puts our hero in a, in a very precarious position. Let's see what he's got. Damn it, Breeze. But, by the way, a nice guy. Heart of gold. This place seems abandoned, but... You trespass, Jedi. Hi, my name's Tina Ivlev. I play Marin in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. You must be a night sister. Dothamir is forbidden to you. Leave at once. Easy. She's from uh, a coven that is extinct now. She's the last of her kind. She can raise the dead pretty much whenever she wants. Cal and Marin come from a similar background of loss. They, they both experienced watching those that they care about die. She's spent her entire life growing up believing that the Jedi are responsible for killing her sisters. They will have their revenge. Marin has a wall up in a similar way that Cal does at the start of the story. It takes him proving himself over and over and over and over again for her to realize, like, okay, maybe, maybe this guy is telling the truth. That was really fun for me to play because Marin is socially, like, she doesn't understand, like, what a normal relationship between people looks like. Sorry. Who was that back there? Imperial Inquisitor. She's a force user hunting Jedi survivors. My name is Elizabeth Grujon, and I play the second sister. She was training to be a Jedi, and her master ended up betraying her not only by leaving her behind, but then also by giving up her location to the Empire. It plays out in such an angry and powerful way when, when she becomes a second sister. What it taught her is to love is to die, and to kill is safety. She was tortured to the point in which psychologically and emotionally the damage had been done. She's already lost everything, so she doesn't care about dying. There's a recklessness. It's like, I'll jump on the top of your ship and bring it down while I'm on it. Like, I don't care. I'm doing a dialect as a character, which just came to me very naturally. Who is your master? Padawan. 
someone that I killed, perhaps. She really enjoys hurting and wounding, so I wanted to hear that pleasure in her voice. <laughs> Not bad. You're learning. And cut. Okay. Now, I've done a lot of character makeup stuff where I've sat in a makeup chair for four hours, five hours before I got to the set. Getting to put Grease Dritus on and not have to go to the makeup chair, that's an extraordinary gift. The cast and crew have become such a family. The we do warm-ups together before every rehearsal. We have breakfast and lunch together every day, so it feels like, hey, like, these are my people. I hope that people walk away with a really wonderful sense of these characters, of the, the, the adventure and story that they've been along for the journey with. You know, the story is about learning to trust and, and trusting in the force and, and what that means. It's about coming together for a mutual purpose and to trust in the fact that ultimately, if you do the work, then maybe, just maybe, the tide will change. It's amazing seeing the mix of different species and people and, and kinds of characters. We're in these incredible, fantastic worlds and planets. Because this franchise is so large and so huge and so tremendous, there are many stories that have yet to be told. Take nine, Mark. Set a course for Bagano. When you're working inside of the motion capture volume, you have cameras on the ceilings, on the sides, and on your face. And they're capturing every single bit of your biomechanics. We can literally run and chase each other and jump and take swings at each other, so... It's the closest to playing in my backyard at eight years old of any job I've ever had. Action. Please welcome Cameron Monaghan to the stage. I'm Cameron Monaghan. I play Cal Kestis in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Cal was a young Jedi Padawan during Order 66 when all of his kind were murdered. He escaped and managed to hide out on the scrap planet of Braca. He became a, a scrap worker and someone in hiding and someone kind of paranoid and fighting for his life. What's this? A Braca scrap rack playing Jedi. Then also he's rough around the edges and I think he kind of does like to fight too. <laughs> I'm gonna need to get through here. Stim. They're full of surprises. BD1, our buddy droid, is uh, a wonderful addition to the droid family. He was sort of designed as like an adventure companion. By having me operating uh, uh, this little guy as a placeholder for the animators, it's also nice for the, for the other actors to have something to play opposite. And so that's kind of fun because then I can inject a little personality that I feel that, that BD1 has. The two of them have a really wonderful relationship. In many ways, I think Hal's kind of best friend across the story. Real moves on. <laughs> okay, shut that thing off and grab some seeds. Seer and Grease enter into Cal's life explosively, and I think that Cal is of two minds about it. You've been surviving on your own for so long that it's impossible to trust anyone. And it's what's kept you alive. I think that ultimately he has to do this mission because this is what he was made for. He's a Jedi trying to restore balance. Before we do anything, I need to know something. How come you're no longer a Jedi? Seer Junda completely cut the Force out of use in her life. I had an experience that changed my perspective and she decided that she would not use the force because using it might pose a threat to not only her but to others which it already did to a certain extent yeah the man is my ship but you better pay attention to this lady here green's Dritus is not let's say the most affable latiron he's had some hardship in life he doesn't trust people too much what is that <laughs> get off myself i can't 
hope you found something better out there than this droid. Oh, calm down, Breeze. He's got something he's running from, and uh, it puts our hero in a, in a very precarious position. Let's see what he's got. Damn it, Breeze. But, by the way, a nice guy. Heart of gold. This place seems abandoned, but... You trespass, Jedi. Hi, my name is Tina Ivlev. I play Marin in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. You must be a night sister. Dothamir is forbidden to you. Leave at once. Easy. She's from uh, a coven that is extinct now. She's the last of her kind. She can raise the dead pretty much whenever she wants. Cal and Marin come from a similar background of loss. They, they both experienced watching those that they care about die. She's spent her entire life growing up believing that the Jedi are responsible for killing her sisters. They will have their revenge. Marin has a wall up in a similar way that Cal does at the start of the story. It takes him proving himself over and over and over and over again for her to realize, like, okay, maybe, maybe this guy is telling the truth. That was really fun for me to play because Marin is socially, like, she doesn't understand, like, what a normal relationship between people looks like. Sorry. Who was that back there? Imperial Inquisitor. She's a force user hunting Jedi survivors. My name is Elizabeth Gujon, and I play the second sister. She was training to be a Jedi, and her master ended up betraying her, not only by leaving her behind, but then also by giving up her location to the Empire. It plays out in such an angry and powerful way when, when she becomes a second sister. What it taught her is to love is to die, and to kill is safety. She was tortured to the point in which psychologically and emotionally the damage had been done. She's already lost everything, so she doesn't care about dying. There's a recklessness. It's like, I'll jump on the top of your ship and bring it down while I'm on it. Like, I don't care. I'm doing a dialect as a character, which just came to me very naturally. Who is your master? Padawan. Someone may have killed, perhaps. She really enjoys hurting and wounding, so I wanted to hear that pleasure in her voice. <laughs> Not bad. You're learning. And cut. Now, I've done a lot of character makeup stuff where I've sat in a makeup chair for four hours, five hours before I got to the set. Getting to put Grease Dritus on and not have to go to the makeup chair, that's an extraordinary gift. The cast and crew have become such a family that we do warm-ups together before every rehearsal. We have breakfast and lunch together every day, so it feels like, hey, like, these are my people. I hope that people walk away with a really wonderful sense of these characters, of the, the, the adventure and story that they've been along for the journey with. You know, the story is about learning to trust and, and trusting in the Force and, and what that means. It's about coming together for a mutual purpose and to trust in the fact that ultimately, if you do the work, then maybe, just maybe, the tide will change. Every three-year-old, four-year-old, before they can possibly string a sentence together, can probably sing one of the Star Wars tunes. I grew up such a huge fan of John Williams' music. In fact, he's probably the most influential composer on my own writing. It's got that, that ingrained in the public consciousness. To be able to play with those toys is pretty cool. I'm Stephen Barton. My name is Gordy Hab, and I'm one of the two composers on Jedi Fallen Order. Relatively early on, Nick Laviers, who's our audio director, he was looking at the scope of it and was like, there's, there's so much music in this, it's like one person isn't going to be able to write this, and this is huge. Stephen Barton and I have been working um, together since Titanfall 2, and uh, I wanted to bring him onto the project because I felt really strongly that he complemented what Gordy would be able to bring. I got my start maybe 10 years ago working on Star Wars The Old Republic and uh, it sort of snowballed from there and I've, I think I've written maybe somewhere in the ballpark of 20 hours of music for Star Wars projects <laughs> so far. We 
people do it in terms of you know starting off with your theme. And yeah, figuring out what, what moments yeah, we're yeah. going to do. Yeah. 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 We sit down and we'll play through sections of the game together, and um, we'll do kind of big spotting sessions while playing the game. One of the things that's interesting about games generally now, but actually certainly this game, is, is that the line between cinematic and gameplay is becoming ever blurred. <laughs> gameplay, you have to really think interactively. Like, this music may last two minutes, it may last ten minutes. You have to sort of factor that in, like how you're building in loops or building in, you know, alternate endings or layering system where you might need to ramp up the intensity of the music, for example. But then writing for cutscenes is much more like writing for a film, where you have a finite timeline and you're writing music to fit that finite timeline. We started out, I think, by really looking at themes of the main characters, and so you have this unique challenge with Star Wars where everyone knows all the Star Wars themes, and so it's like being asked to, you know, put an extra six feet on the top of the Great Pyramid. We were trying to see how far we could push the boundaries of the John Williams vibe with it still feeling like it was in the Star Wars universe. We start with such a small little cell of an idea for Cal's theme, for example, but over the course of the game, because there's so much gameplay, that theme really develops. By the end of the game, it's taken on a whole new life than it had in the very beginning of the game. Thanks, little droid. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. <laughs> the favorite material that I've had to work on is everything to do with BD-1, just because it's such a unique and charming character. Cal might go through some tough emotional moments, but BD is always going to be there to encourage him. You know, the very much the fact it's sort of a boy and his dog kind of story. The way to approach that musically was kind of like a nostalgia trip. No, we are not doing that again. There's a section in the game where you're on Kashyyyk and you're climbing the origin tree. It's about a 15 to 20 minute long piece of music. It's almost like a symphony that starts from the very ground level all the way to the top. That was probably my favorite moment to write for. We are getting ready for our first scoring session in London. Um, we've written about... Yeah, uh, probably close, almost 50 minutes of music. Yeah, um, which is probably plenty, so far. plenty for a session. We recorded Jedi Fallen Order score at Abbey Road Studios in London, and we're using the London Symphony and the best musicians that London has to offer. To any aficionado of Star Wars will know that from Empire through to the end of the prequel trilogy was all recorded there. The first time I heard the orchestra play, I thought we were listening to one of John Williams' scores on the speakers, just sound checking. It has a special thing, um, and you hear it. I mean, you really do feel it. You know, you're, you're standing in the same spot that, you know, the Beatles' day in the life was recorded conducting a symphony orchestra. It's, there's, you know, there's nothing better than that. One of the things that Cordy and I have had a lot of fun with is finding versions of instruments that aren't, are sort of either forgotten or lesser used. So we have like a, a contrabass clarinet and this thing looks like a plumbing fixture. I mean, it's like, it's huge, but it has something you haven't heard before. Good. Nice. Okay, great. Nice. Good stuff. Good job. Good afternoon. Good job. Mm. Stephen has a very unique voice, and he's got a very colorful way of thinking about music. It's incredibly rewarding to work with Gordy because there's things that he did with my themes that I'd never have thought of, and I was sort of like, just hearing them for the first time was a, was a joy, because you're like, oh, I, I, I'd, have, I'd have never have thought to do that. Stephen brings very fine espresso coffee, and Gordy brings great whiskey. <laughs> uh, so between the two of them, they're an absolute delight to work with. I just love working with those guys. I hope that when the player finishes playing Jedi Fallen Order that they will 
feel like they were taken on a journey in part because of the music. We hope you love it, but I mean, I think, I think it's one of those ones where we hope it feels like a cohesive part of the story to the point where the game is part of a bigger whole. You certainly can't watch the films without the music. They're married to each other. So I hope we achieve that sense of just, you know, this is just a unique and an amazing ride. We're here doing a planet tour of uh, a couple different planets in Jedi Fallen Order. And this is Bagana. Hey, BD-1, I'm Cal. Here on Pagano, I've mostly been working on um, scripting through like a lot of the um, moments between Cal and BD-1 to uh, showcase the relationship and, and, and show how we get to know each other a little bit. Hold on, y you know the Jedi? Hold on. Everything we're doing with, um, with BD-1 and Cal's relationship here um, isn't just about writing the script for it, it's about like how we represent it in the world. Part of that comes in through our cinematics, but we try to like think about it, um, you know, from an in-game perspective instead of just like looking at it on a piece of paper. Gameplay first is like a respawn sort of philosophy, and narrative centers especially, um, that's really important for us. So we have, you know, like scans and echoes as like ways of telling small stories that are tied into reward mechanisms and gameplay and exploration, um, and that's you know a way of trying to find a balance between how we're telling the story and what your gameplay experience is as well. Bagana's designed as like a measuring stick for the player. It's their first planet that they can retraverse. That's one of the challenges of Bagano is once the player has unlocked all their abilities, they can um, double jump over everything and wall climb and zip line all over the place. And so I think it was important throughout our game to keep it close to design, but even more so in Bagano since there's so much double jumping to different islands. After each ability you get, you can kind of come back to Bagano and and it unlocks a little different section of it depending on which abilities you've gotten on the other planets. So you can always kind of come back and explore it with your new abilities in mind. So you're kind of teaching the player that it's not just main path in this game. It's there's there's different side areas to explore. So either use your force powers to kind of solve a little puzzle. Um, Cordova's extremely dangerous workshop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, he was a full-fledged Jedi. And his so life like, on the edge. Yeah. <laughs> So this is a moment that, that's kind of an important Metroidvania moment here where you, you, we slam you right into um, essentially a gate. This is essentially a gate because you don't have the ability to cross it yet. You can tell that the main path goes that way. It, it, we lead you right there. That, that's your goal, the vault. Um, and we frame it you know, between these, these rocks here, but the player has no way to cross this gap yet. So now the player just needs to kind of explore the level to figure out how to cross that, bridge that gap. In Bagano, in our initial concept, we kind of had these unending shapes of rock and striations of kind of like red clay. Because the wall runs that we're about to introduce the player to, the kind of the language along the wall runs is we try to do smaller striations on where you can wall run. So right off the bat, with your new wall run ability, we've, we've got kind of different secrets and things to explore and find. But we try to funnel you back to this moment where now you can cross the gap that you blocked you before. Players have had a hard time finding that, and it's just something that when you model it, and when, you, when Jeff designs it, you're like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The player will use that wall run to get back, but you watch players just get walk lost right and by. walk right by <laughs> it. So it's stuff you don't think about first pass, and then you watch a few play tests, and you start to realize that we need to do more to help the player. All right, so here we've got the option uh, at this point in the game to choose uh, to go to either Zepho or Dathomir. Here uh, you see we've centered the centered it in Bagano and we've got these kind of two options um, where the player can freely choose to go either to Zepho and kind of continue the main path or or deviate a little bit and go to Dathomir. And the, the UI team you can even see like the what went into this like they're almost equal choices, but Zeppo's slightly closer to the cursor. Like, this is intentional. Like, this sort of thing, um, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into this. It's a literal fork in the road. Literal fork in the road, exactly. Yeah. So, which do you guys want to choose? Let's, uh, let's go to Dathomir. I agree. Okay, <laughs> let's go to Dathomir. 
we're doing a planet tour of Dathomir today. Uh, gonna look at the art, game design, and the narrative all together. Dathomir's a special place because it is one of the planets that pre-existed, so we had um, a really kind of fun relationship with Lucasfilm for this one because we, there was like a lot of back and forth and a lot of cool ideas kind of thrown around. We have uh, three tombs throughout the game. Uh, the tomb that you find here is the tomb of Kujet, who really kind of consolidated power, um, became just um, tyrannical, um, murdered those that they disagreed with. And so it's a really kind of dark time for the Zepho um, in general. And you see that kind of theme play out here in uh, the fact that the art for the Zepho even starts to look a little bit more um, imperial here almost. So when I initially blocked this out, I kind of had a general idea of what things we wanted the player to be able to obtain, but the architecture and stuff, at that time, we didn't have a lot of concepts. So luckily, Jean came aboard, and he was able to conceptualize this area, actually all the spaces, in, in 3D based on my block out. And so his concepts actually inspired me to change some of my layout, just because it felt, it felt more believable. It felt like a place when I saw his concept. This whole right side didn't look anything like this. It wasn't until Jean did a 3D concept where he had this very tiered kind of look, and I was like, oh, that looks really cool for gameplay and visually more interesting. And Jean kind of talked about how he came up with that. One of my main inspirations was uh, Petra, like in Jordan. They built an entire civilization in this kind of remote part of the desert. It's an abandoned place, but people are living here, and they're repurposing it completely differently. That's the Knight Brothers. And so you have this kind of like layering in the in environment, you know, uh, storytelling that I thought was kind of, you know, it's kind of interesting to try to communicate to player. Dathomir was a matriarchy. Um, so the Knight Brothers were ruled over by the Knight Sisters, who were, of course, um, <laughs> slaughtered. There was a genocide committed against them, basically, by um, General Grievous uh, during the Clone Wars. We played around with a number of Knight Brothers, and we actually had to work with the cinematic team, because I think in cinematic they had like four or five of them pop out, and we realized that these guys are pretty hard, so we managed to get down to two. Um, these guys are really agile, they roll around, um, and they're pretty quick, so we wanted to make this space feel good for them, for the first fight at least. In some of the other areas in Dathomir it gets a little bit more narrow, but definitely in this first encounter with them, you have a lot of room to kind of move around and fight with them. And so that was the intent. John, you even made like some paintings or hieroglyphs at the back. Like, yeah, the yeah, yeah. I made, like, uh, there's a whole uh, Night uh, Brother mural walls, language like, of like their relationship with the spiders and the bat and the Zephonians. That's pretty slick. What's, what's that one, John? It looks like. Yeah, uh, that, actually, there's a the whole story. language. Christmas trees. So I, I actually developed like a whole language of like what those signs mean. Okay. And uh, and yeah, that's supposed to be you know don't cross uh, don't cross, this, like don't so cross cool. this okay. uh, this place this 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 is a night bro this is basically night brother territory. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you look up, actually, there's like some of those uh, statues. That's a good example of like night brothers using whatever parts of scavenging whatever parts of uh, things they can find on the planet, even like some Zepho statue parts, and making their own art with it. That's how they survive. When you come into this cave, it's probably the biggest drop-off you do in the game to really make it feel like you're dropping down into somewhere very deep. And it's kind of a one-way, too. Like, at a certain point, you can't get back out. I think it changes the mood, too. It's like, okay, something's probably going to happen here. So this is basically what I've been doing the last quite a few months, basically, since I got here, is doing this bat boss. He's been quite the challenge. He's one of the unique characters in the game, so he actually responds to different body part hits. So, like, I think he's the only guy in the game that currently does that. These markers are meant to kind of show his uh, his, his weak spots, is the is the kind of hope. Kind of seeing with play test, it looked like he needed a little bit more indication as to that. He's like a glass cannon, right? Like, you get hurt pretty bad if you get hit, but I've given the player a lot of tools to be able to kind of get back into the fight with the bat. The environment art's not finished, basically to convey, like, more that there's a relationship between the Bat and the Knight Brothers, like, they're afraid of uh, the Bat, but they also kind of, like, like, worship it or, like, respect it. Yeah, it's, he's like the alpha of the planet, I yeah, guess, right? Yeah, kind of. Kind of has that creature of the Black Lagoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, his face is pretty gnarly. Now he has eyes. I feel guilty, like, stabbing him and stuff. Now. I'm like, oh, man. Like, I was fine when he was just, like, a box. I know. Now, and now I'm like, now oh, dude. Bad. We're bros, though. We've been through so much together, but I have to defeat you. So we're finishing up production on the game right now. We're going to be playing through some of Zepho today. I'm one of the level designers that's been working on this level. We're like not too far out from locking the game so that basically all hands are off except bug fixing. So all the last design work and especially all the last art is getting in right now. Oh yeah. What are these? I think they're called skunkuses. I love these things. They're called poppers, at least internally. Mm -hmm. And they're just little guys that if you walk into them, they'll, oh my god, I'm going to have to be very careful. I'm not walking into any more of them. I don't have enough health for that. But the skunguses are little environmental obstacles that the player needs to avoid walking into, which can make uh, normal platforming challenges more interesting. Um, for example, right here, just having to walk around and jump through an area that otherwise would be pretty simple for the player to navigate, but requires them to use a little more thought to make sure that they don't actually get damaged. Um, and here, going down this slide, having to make sure to avoid them while sliding down. When we get the level from level artists, we generally already have some placeholders for where the enemy gonna be. The ones on the slide and the ones on the jump, they've been there for so long. A couple weeks ago, the art finally went in for the actual Skunga, so it was nice to finally see them after yeah. three, three years. The old design version of them was just like a little spear with two little, like, Eyes. two eyeballs. They were just white and black, big yeah, eyeballs. Yeah. They were hilarious. A lot of the rooms have like the wind blown patterns all over the walls, just to kind of show the wind that has been happening in here for who knows how long. But this helps like tie all the architecture together and give like a unique look. It shows like it's a really small area with not a very long gameplay, but for game development, it actually take years and many revisions to get to here. So I think we probably have to uh, tune down the lighting a little, a little bit more. And I think the floating illuminations will probably oh yeah we also have, have, have an asset for them. <laughs> oh yeah probably yeah. <laughs> this is on my on my list <laughs> I'm gonna make it with my list my specific work here more entails collectibles like scans and echoes the echoes are a little bit more mysterious so we're trying to make them have more of an emotional impact I'm getting a strange feeling from this one ancient Zepho gathered here. I wonder why. So now we're kind of happening upon the, the other side of this mountain, and then we're, we're kind of revealing this crashed Veneta, which is a ship that you can see, you will have seen from the landing pad. And it's kind of, it's kind of one of those like, gaming cliches that like, if you can see it, you can actually go there. But in this case, you can get up close. Um, if you're an exploring player, you can, um, you can actually go in later. Well, it's one of my favorite parts of Zepho. Just this fight arena around it, the open space that Martin designed is really, really cool. So we've got a small ecology system, and so you'll see as you kind of play through the game, you'll have like multi-faction fights. All these creatures have relationships to one another, so that Skaz is like a, a prey of this brute, uh, but then you're the bigger threat, so he's going after, after you right now. Okay, so now Cal is heading towards uh, Kashyyyk. He's kind of got this hint about this uh, Wookiee named Tarful, and that's kind of the next uh, breadcrumb on his journey. Today we're going to be looking at Kashyyyk. We're going to be looking at this uh, second half of this level, seeing the, the jungle and the kind of beginnings of the origin tree and the Shadowlands. And it was exciting developing it and excited to show you guys. So this was actually a good opportunity for us to show this juxtaposition again of this kind of built imperial environment with this refinery and the more natural landscape of Kashyyyk that they're just dicing up with all their cutters and exploiting for all its resources. Especially here, coming out onto the vista, really establishes that contrast, seeing how kind of organic shapes come in contact with the straight and harsh architecture of the Imperial refinery. They're kind of struggling to push back against all this fauna, and you know they've disturbed the balance of this place. The origin tree is a unique foundation for Kashyyyk you haven't seen before you're used to seeing the more beach areas, all this stuff. This is kind of a different side of the planet where the origin trees 
the reign supreme. Its roots stretch across the entire uh, vista, and you feel its impact everywhere. So it's definitely a landmark. You, you know where to go to. Yeah, and I think especially selling this idea of this kind of, this source kind of uh, mother tree and all these roots extending into this jungle, showing how that's being severed. If you follow the root system, you'll see how it comes right into contact and is being destroyed by the empire there. This is the entrance to the Shadowlands, so it's a little bit intimidating, but I mean, you're a Jedi, so nothing really <laughs> uh, stands in your way. Right. This is uh, the first area that you go through. It's uh, like the interior of one of the roots. Yeah, it was definitely challenging trying to figure out, like, what does the inside of a tree look like? Mainly looked and referenced, uh, like, sandstone cliffs. A little bit of uh, kind of the inside of bones, too. Yeah. Hang on! The Night Sister has been hunting the player throughout Shadowlands, and as you reach the top of the Shadowlands roots, she chases the player down back to the front of the origin tree. So basically, you're sliding down sort of a mud canal through these Shadowlands roots with the uh, Tyre Reaper coming after you. I'll never forget when we first debuted this section to us, Floss. <laughs> a little bit terrified, but... I was um, scared. Yeah, we were scared, yeah. It's a lot of environment that you're traversing through totally. very quickly, but it's a fun puzzle to solve, and sometimes it can be a really exciting result, something that we weren't expecting either. I know it was scary to you guys, but you guys knocked it out of the park. Since we just got double jump, I wanted to have sort of a really fun wall run chain sequence. It's funny, the art that Ryan made for the wall run, he called it the Septuple wall run art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a model name. It has to be one of our longest wall runs in our game, huh? Uh, uh, yeah, so. probably. Yeah. yeah. We'll make that claim, I think. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> double jump makes it a little bit more uh, forgiving, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, because previously we learned double jump right here. Right. Uh, and then oh, we yeah. Yeah, we decided to bring it down sooner, so now you have the experience of double jumping all over this tree, mm -hmm. which I thought was a really good idea. Uh, Great on Bloss's yeah. part. There's a back and forth with the player and, an, and a boss um, that you're trying to capture, like a one-on-one -on -one fight. Because a normal AI, their, their behavior is quite simplistic. Um, they've only got a few mechanics that you need to learn. Um, but with boss, you, you, can't, you can't have that over a long fight. So with bosses, they have to evolve and, and change as the fight progresses to give the players more things to learn and more things to try to fight against. They need to have an answer for everything that the player can do, whereas many standard AIs just have a simple, I'm just going to go on the offense with what I know rather than I'm going to respond to what the player is doing to me. So when making bosses, um, she has this whole array of combat moves and I need to make sure that there's the small openings that the player can take advantage of. Um, it's not too big or too small, um, but just enough just to test the player. This was the tour of Kashyyyk. There's more planets to explore, and I hope you continue our adventure in uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order.